When the comedian Jon Stewart tackled CNBC's Jim Cramer in 2009 about why the news network failed to warn of the financial crisis, Cramer said it was a one in a million occurrence. But the financial crisis was at least a decade in the making, and financial media in general failed to warn the public what was going on. So what's wrong with the financial media? Are they obsessed with breaking news and scoops rather than holding companies and industries to account? Welcome to The Big Question, the monthly video series from Capital Ideas at Chicago Booth. I'm Hal Weitzman, and with me to discuss the issue is an expert panel. Dean Starkman is a fellow in residence at the Center for Media, Data and Society at the Central European University in Budapest. A former reporter for the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times and an editor at the Columbia Journalism Review, he was part of the investigative team at the Providence Journal that won a Pulitzer Prize in 1994. He's the author of The Watchdog That Didn't Bark, The Financial Crisis and the Disappearance of Investigative Journalism. And Guy Rolnick is a clinical associate professor of strategic management at Chicago Booth. He founded and served as editor-in-chief of The Marker, the Israeli financial news company. And at Booth, he teaches a class on reputation, regulation and communications, how media influences business. Panel, welcome to The Big Question. Dean Startwin, let me start with you. Basic question, why should the media be a watchdog? It's an interesting question to hear because essentially for me, uh, the better question is why be a journalist at all if you're not going to be a watchdog? It's, a, it's a, an essential function, actually the core function of what journalists do. When you sort of think about it, um, uh, the idea of being a, a journalist is in, uh, being a watchdog is inherent in the journalist role. Why? Because here we are, we, we, we are representing ourselves as people who are uh, reporting the news and telling people what's happening. Well, um, you don't suddenly, suddenly switch on your watchdog cap and decide, oh, I'm going to actually dig a little bit deeper between, you know, behind the scenes to see what, what's going on. You're there as a, you, you, you purport, you're, you're presenting yourself to the public as somebody, I'm, I'm here, I, I am covering this institution, say it's City Hall or Goldman Sachs, and uh, I'm, you're, you're basically there to tell people what's, what's, what's actually going on. You're not a, use the word media, it's sort of interesting. It, the, lat, it's the, the, the Latin root for media is middle. And that's not how I see what journalism does. Journalism is the French, from the French word jour. So it tells you what's happening that day. Um, and so it, it, we're, our, our um, the, the question is interesting because it presupposes that we're sort of this passive transmitter of, of information from institutions. But isn't that what most journalism is? I mean, it ultimately, aren't people reporting what is happening? I mean, if you're covering, you know, sport, most of the time you're, re you're reporting on what is happening in sporting events. If you're covering business, presumably most of the time you're reporting what is happening in the business world uh, and, and kind of what is happening day to day. It's so w where does the watchdog part come in? Um, well, I mean, it, it, is, it is all too true that, um, that often media or journalism or news organizations are content to be transmitters of what's happening on the soccer field uh, or uh, you know, you know, what's happening within the four corners of, uh, of the diamond at Wrigley Field. But in fact, um, that is, uh, you know, it is one function and it actually, is, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with the idea of letting people know what major institutions and, and, uh, and people and act, powerful actors are are thinking and saying and what they intend to do. I mean, that's, you know, when the mayor comes out with his budget, that's what you report it. It's not a problem, but the idea that somehow that, that's the, that is the uh, sum and substance of your job is actually, um, uh, you know, first, it, it's ne it was never been true. Uh, secondly, it's not practical because, in fact, um, uh, facts lead you in, in all sorts of directions in, in an ideal world, um, uh, media, uh, Journalists are required to follow the facts where, where they go. And thirdly, um, when you think about it, uh, uh, it it's, it's, it's actually very uh, dangerous practice to try and confine your reporting to what's simply presented to you because your own credibility is at stake. Um, so often uh, you'll see, um, just as with the financial crisis, but you can say almost any other event, say uh, so you're talking about sports, uh, say, the, the steroid era. There was a, a, a platoon of, of sports writers writing about uh, Barry Bonds as he ballooned into this you know, grotesque figure and Sammy Sosa and the rest, and it was like, a, obviously, to, 
It's for everyone. About baseball players who are taking steroids. Yeah, steroids. It's an American, a uh, bit of an American uh, metaphor, but the point being that you know, sports reporting was was enormously discredited by the fact that um, you know after uh, the veil was pulled away and an investigative reporters from the San Francisco Chronicle were the first to break the story that, uh, oh, by the way, this entire uh, era of baseball is essentially a farce has to be thrown out. So it's really damaging for, um, for media, for news organizations to, to try and confine their role to this, uh, to this sort of passive, uh, okay. uh, uh, passive role. Okay, Guy Rowling? Yeah, so assume in democracy and in the market system that the voters are informed and that the players in the market are being uh, informed. But we also know that uh, voters and uh, citizens and consumers sometimes don't have the economic incentives uh, to do, uh, to acquire information about what the politicians are doing, what the regulators are doing, what, what the players in the market are doing. And the most important role of the media, of journalists, of course, is to overcome this collective action problem, to do uh, uh, to research and to aggregate and to be a watchdog because many times in many markets nobody has an incentive to do it. Okay. Dean Stark, when you, you, in your book you, you criticize, uh, as do many other people, the, the media for not really having spotted the financial crisis looming and building up over, over many years. Has the media ever really spotted a financial crisis and, and, and could they have done anything to prevent it happening? Did they even kind of help cause it in a way by not reporting it? Absolutely. Um, 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 journalism actually could have headed off or, yeah, really helped contain the, uh, the mortgage crisis, which, which metastasized into the financial crisis. And it is a fair question um, whether or not um, media has uh, <clears throat> ever called a big financial crisis. Um, and uh, is there an example? Because your your book is somewhat nostalgic. You sort of say there was a period when this was happening. So in my book, one of the things I try to do is give a historical view and try to make the case that wait a minute, anyone dis, dis actually dismisses institutional media, mainstream media, is probably doing so out of ignorance. Because in fact, if you look over this period, particularly post-war, particularly since the '60s, when investigative journalism became this mainstream practice, actually rather impressive, sometimes even glorious record. In, in bringing uh, holding power to account and and in, in generating really important reforms. So one ex just one example was that people don't think about is the tobacco industry. You forget the tobacco industry in the 90s was enormously powerful. They were the Wall Street of their time, and essentially there is no question from anybody that the reason that um, the tobacco industry is essentially transformed by the end of the 90s was because of the reporting of. Wall Street Journal, ABC News, and 60 Minutes, and other other outlets. So, you, so the idea that uh, journalism is, can't is ineffectual is <clears throat> flat false. Period. Full stop. <clears throat> Having said that, um, it's fair. I mean, one thing that you have to we have to we defenders of the media, people who like media, want it to be strong and robust and all that. And we have to we have to work with is the fact that it it. Um, you know, it's better, seems to be better at the small to medium sized things, although well, tobacco is a pretty big deal, and it sometimes misses the, the big ones. The savings and loans, which collapsed in, uh, in the late 80s, leaving a, a, you know, a, a, a bill for taxpayers in the $300 billion range, sort of a, a warm up for, uh, for uh, uh, subsequent financial crises, um, was, uh, I, I, as I was saying, sort of served up on a platter to some news organizations. And, it's in my book, but it's just a bit of a scandal that that, that was missed uh, because, again, it wasn't like it was hiding anywhere. Um, however, to, having said all that, um, uh, the idea that, um, um, that, uh, that institutional media has always been this sort of uh, lapdog is, is quite false. And it's actually rather dangerous because, um, you know, frankly, the public relies on media for Really, it's the oxygen of democracy, and it's their, the only truly independent force out there who, that's, uh, that's providing scrutiny to powerful institutions, and, in, including the government. And uh, uh, so to dismiss it is a huge mistake. Many times the media is the problem. I think it was uh, the economist uh, Robert Schiller that in uh, 2000 wrote his famous book, uh, Rational Exuberance, 
where he forecasted basically the popping of the of the uh, dot com bubble, and he did a survey of uh, financial uh, financial bubbles uh, in the history, going back to uh, the Netherlands, the tulips in uh, a bubble, and basically he said, you know, uh, in order to have a financial bubble, you need a large group of people. Uh, to have the same idea. And guess who spreads the idea? Who is more, the most efficient vehicle in spreading the same idea for many people? Of course, it's the media. So basically, if we look at the financial bubbles and media, we'll see that their history is intertwined. We started seeing financial bubble with the ascent of mass media. And I think this is probably the case of the dot-com. It's does probably the case does of... Does that mean mass media are always to blame for financial crisis just in, in being the conduit for the information. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure that it's always to blame, but sometimes it has a, it has a part in it. And of course, when, we, uh, when researchers study what happened to the interplay between media and markets, they see that the, the, the more you have a bull market, the ability and the willingness of media uh, to go after the big players and to be more critical diminishes. Basically, when you need the media, they are many times in cahoots with the players, with the financial, uh, with the financial players, and so on. Basically, when we have financial scandals, when we have uh, market failures, when we have government failures, uh, there is this narrative. Some people will say, "Well, this is all captured by special interests. They capture it. It's by lobbying, by revolving doors, by financial incentives." And to some extent, this is all very true. But as we know, for these inequalities, for these market failures, for these government failures to persist over time, you need legitimacy by the people. You cannot have it just by the power of money or the, by the power of government. So at the end of the day, if you want to have those aberrations for a long time, you need media to cooperate Absolutely. with this narrative. No so there is, if you, many, many times the capture is intellectual capture, and this is basically where the media comes in and plays a significant role. So media cannot say, well, no, we are, we are just reporting. Uh, it's the corrupted players in politician. It's the corrupted the CEO. It doesn't work this way. At the end of the day, in a capitalistic democracy, you need legitimacy. Right. I was just going to say, and it's precisely at that moment when uh, I would say instead of media, journalism has to step in to sort of counter the narrative that 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 would um, that sort of uh, presupposes a more active, you know, a, you know, a, <clears throat> sort of a agency kind of role for journalism, which I feel is the sort of the missing link in a lot of these these times. So, for instance, um, guys write that. Um, so in the 1990s, when the tech bubble was forming, um, you know there was th that was the time for journalism to sort of counter that the, the narrative of the of the new economy would transform. You know the valuations were not, and and there was some of that, but not enough. And also in in um, but even more so during the mortgage era, when um, when when Wall Street was growing to become these colossuses, colossi that bestrode the globe. It was time for the, the media to, to to step in and say, "Wait a minute, this uh, this uh, is not necessarily healthy for the financial system, for the economy, and and to provide a, a counter." Uh, and what actually happened? Because uh, I referred in the introduction to this uh, great interview between John Stewart and Jim Cramer, and Stewart's argument is essentially that Jim Cramer and everyone else at CNBC knew what was going on. They knew there were nefarious practices on Wall Street, but they didn't report it. In other words, it was almost like a deliberate cover-up. Your thesis is slightly different. It's almost that the practices in newsrooms meant they didn't even really know what was going on. Right. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily... We're deconstructing John Stewart, but I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, uh, I didn't read the John Stewart critique, and it was so important because it... I, my, my, my take on that was, was like, hey, you guys are there every day. You, pur you purport to cover this beat 24-7. Uh, uh, and, and yet, and you're saying, well, there was no way we could have known. How is that possible? What happened? Um, and, that's, and that's sort of how, you know, that's how, um, and, and my, my, my analysis of that was like, <clears throat> okay, well, let's just say Jim Cramer, who I've met, and you know, nice guy, whatever, and, um, but his, you know, uh, 
uh, methods and his sources are all about Wall Street elites and and check you know ch ch checking to see if uh, you know what you know what, what you know Bear Stearns profitability and that kind of thing. Well, that if those are the only people you're looking at, if you have no idea, right? Uh, you, you know that they have uh, enormous amounts of mortgage products on their balance sheet, right? You have no idea what the, what those products represent and how they were made, right? See, uh, even even uh, Jimmy Kane, who ran Bear Stearns, had no idea how those mortgage products came to be. You had to be, you know, you had to actually have been at the ground level to understand what was going on. You know, in the financial world, they have uh, sell side analysts and buy side analysts. So the sales analysts are the one that you read their research uh, uh, everywhere, and basically they are selling securities and getting commissions from tradings or from uh, m as and so on. And then you have the buy-side analysts. Those are analysts that never publicize what they are doing because they are doing it for their propriety trading or for their clients. Now, uh, the financial television, is it a sell side or buy side? It's more of a sell side. It's more of entertainment. So when you look at the business model of those companies that do those uh, financial uh, television shows, at the end of the day, their ratings and their audience and their access is based on being positive. If they continue to be negative, if we went out with, in a campaign that the financial market now is super dangerous because of subprime and they'll do it one year in two years and the bubble wouldn't pop, they would go out of business. So, you know, to ex when we look at the media to expect the people specifically in financial TV to be the watchdog, I think you're, you're probably looking at the wrong direction. Okay, so where would, it, where would the watchdog be then? You mean in the traditional printed media? Well, I would expect the, uh, the watchdog today as we look at it to be with the uh, financial media, with the uh, accountability newspapers that still have a business model that is based on quality. As we know, it has become tougher and tougher and more complicated in the last 30 years because of the disintegration of the business model of uh, print newspapers, namely the disappearance of the classified, which was the engine of money for many uh, newspapers. So I would still expect to see that in the, in the print uh, uh, big uh, uh, newspapers and, not exp and, and they wouldn't expect it to see it on TV. Okay, Dean Starkman, part of your thesis is that the, the um, demand for scoops in journalism, for, you know, this, we must get the news five seconds before our competitor, which has got faster and faster and faster over the past decade or so, that that has sort of destroyed the old fashioned, you know, shoe leather investigative journalism that really holds um, institutions uh, to account. So are media organizations that aren't obsessed with scoops, let's say The Economist magazine, are, are they better at c accountability? It's interesting to think about. Well, I mean, the, the, what I was trying to just talk about with, <clears throat> with that is that um, I, was trying to, I was trying to sort of explain or to, or to figure out for myself why the news looks the way it does. Uh, why is it that so often uh, the news looks like it's subservient to these institutions, essentially transmitting what they say, or maybe doing it five seconds, five minutes before, five, five hours before everybody else. And, but but occasionally, if you say it, occasionally they are actually subversive, and 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 are and, and are actually um, uh, confrontational and, and bring these kind of public interest information into the into the public sphere. And you know what I was trying to talk about was that. You know, all both you know the news organizations are are made up of these two poles. I mean, you, I, I, I have in no sense of the word denounce or have any problem with scoops. I've gotten a few myself over the years, and and they're immensely satisfying. It does serve investors, and 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 you know, there's not a, not a thing wrong with it, except it's an entirely a transactional uh, form of reporting. It has it has very little to do with you know with uh, with the big picture, certainly, and systemic problems, and holding anyone to account. In fact, it's a win-win-win thing for everybody, and that's all right. Somebody good. somebody wants to get the information out. They find a. a and is it really a win-win-win? There is somebody that is losing out there, right? Well, my competitors lost. I love no. that. And how about the dispersed public that uh, or your readers that they, they lose because in order to get that scoop. Basically, the guy who gave you that scoop wants something back from you. And sometimes the next story, you're going to spin it no, no in a positive way. Otherwise, he won't give you that no, uh, story. No question, no question. Yeah. My only argument in that book was like, okay, 
It's like first trying to stop access reporting is just like trying to hold back the tide or, or prevent the sun from coming up in the morning. And when you it's say what, access reporting, you mean that scoop, scoop it, interviews with stuff. CEOs and So actually, I, I tend to a little bit disagree here, and I tell you why. Because access, first of all, access, which biases the, the, the reporter and biases the editor and biases the newspaper, is one of a few uh, biases. We have the ownership bias, we have the advertisers bias, we have, all the, we have sometimes the audience bias that you have to cater to the bias of your audience. But the scoop bias, which is the access bias, is one that actually we can gradually get rid of. And the reason, of course, is the internet. 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you could have said that there is economic value in bringing this story a day or five hours or five minutes before your competitor. Now this economic value has disappeared basically because if I scoop you, you just do a follow up on it after 10 minutes and I will not be able to get any economic advantages. I won't be able to sell to my readers, I bring the stories first, because you're gonna bring the story five minutes or five seconds after me. Now that the economic incentives is gone, in a way it diminishes the, uh, many times, the business model of some me uh, uh, media outlets, but it also lets us uh, people in the media to start understand that we have to change the culture of our newsroom and start thinking about how to get rid of this access thing because getting the story about m and one hour before your competitor doesn't really add real value to society. So let's just quit doing it if the price that we have to pay is basically the next day to put a positive spin on a merger that is gonna be horrible and destroy value to consumers, to, to uh, investors, or worse than that, create concentration in the market that will drive our yeah, prices. Interesting, right. Okay, I mean, uh, no, I, I will, I will st stand up and defend uh, scoops. I, I, you know, I, I was the one who wrote a book basically uh, warning against them, but, but I, the reason I'll, I'll do that is this. It's just that, um, you know, first, my main complaint about access reporting and scoop-driven reporting is, is in, 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 unlike Guy, isn't in and of itself it, it, as a problem, but it, what it is, it, it, it expands and tends to crowd out the thing, and you talk about, and, and it, to the point where basically you, someone like, uh, you know, a, a informed layperson would think, well, that's what media, that's what media is, and that's really, it's all about, it's all about a struggle over the definition of what, the, what, what news is, what journalism is. My problem is, the trouble is that access reporting tends to, is so uh, popular within newsrooms and within companies and, 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 it, that, and it's you know, relatively quick, easy and cheap. You know, essentially that becomes, that's, our, that's, that's news. Their whole website space, CNBC is an entire network to, you know, devoted to that. Politico essentially is an entire website with 500 people essentially doing that, that alone and that's, that's it's okay, but you know that. But the trouble is that cannot be, that can't be the uh, the, the beginning, middle, and end of our news ecosystem. Otherwise, you're going to get horrific financial crises and things like that. You absolutely must. That's why this very sort of vulnerable um, uh, and and embattled uh, sphere within journalism of accountability reporting needs to be first recognized and understood as a as a as an actual uh, force, and it needs to be. Uh, needs to be um, uh, nourished and supported and expanded to a much larger degree than it is. I mean, but you, uh, Dean, can you explain to us uh, what is the value to the society that you have one newspaper bringing an m and story an hour before the other newspaper? Uh, all right. What does it add value you, to the market, to the efficiency of the market, to asset allo to, to allocation? I, I don't see it. I make that point myself in the book. I, okay. I agree with you. I mean, I, I, you I, I, I cry uncle. I give in. You know, the information is going to be out there sooner or later very fast because basically all those scoops, by basically, these are driven by the PR, by the companies. It's not, yeah. like, it's not like it's not going to be revealed. We're not talking about an investigative piece. We're talking about stuff that is going to be announced in an hour or next day and you're giving it to your friend uh, journalist because you have those relationship with him and it's, it's a quid pro quo.
uh, with him. So think about all the energy and all the uh, uh, resource allocation in newsroom uh, on outscooping that they could have uh, uh, devoted this time and energy to go through the financial statements of some of those companies and to see what's going on. Yeah, it's a it's a small thing. We're not disagreeing that much. In other words, you you could argue that, and there actually have been a few cases where somebody reporting so and so are in talks, and it turns out that that's a disaster for many reasons, and the merger is sort of blown because the guy got the scoop. But that's one in a thousand. Do you feel like the media is a tool placed to? cope with the next financial crisis to warn us? What it really needs is um, structural support and, and cultural support. Right now- And the um, media industry does not have a lot of resources at the moment right to spend Right now, on you know, I'm gonna argue that uh, the sort of the fact gathering resources of the, of the, of the news industry is at a, uh, you know, it's at a catastrophically low ebb. When you look at the size of the economy, the complexity of the economy, the complexity of regulation, and what's happening in a market in the last decade or so, and the growth there, and then you see what's happening to the number of uh, journalists that are covering those uh, things, you see that basically the number of journalists probably halved in uh, 30, uh, 30 years. So you have but less- is it the number or is it the practice? Because you've suggested that it's not necessarily the number, it's what they're doing. They're First of all, it's the practice, as we discussed. And of course, there are some uh, decent uh, news outlets and there are some decent uh, uh, reporters and editors and investigative reporters, but the numbers is uh, diminishing all the time. And uh, uh, corporations and the special interest groups that, that they, and the industries that they have to cover are only getting bigger and more complicated in handling media. And sometimes they even don't, the way they handle media, they bypass media. We know we have a few tech titans today that actually don't need to work with media because they own their own platforms. So this is also something that has uh, uh, changed. And now their own platform is sometimes their market cap and their economic power is 10 times, 20 times, 100 times bigger than the media companies. So we have an imbalance of power that is uh, also uh, playing out here. So if we look at the last 30 years, although we had the internet revolution and we thought that it diminishes entry barrier and so on, at the end of the day, the, economic, the economics of uh, media today are much more complicated than they were uh, 20 or 30 years ago. I think it's a mistake to look at media role to prevent financial crises. Because basically there are crises that are happening every day in many industries here in the United States and all over the world. You don't need a financial collapse to say that something is sometimes wrong with an industry. So I, I don't foresee any bubble uh, popping in the healthcare industry. But as we know, United States healthcare system is one of the worst in the world in terms of its cost and the way it works. So we don't need to, to, to say that there is a problem only after there is a financial bubble. Okay. All right. Well, on that note, uh, our time is up. This has been a fascinating discussion. We'll come back to it. My thanks to our panel, Dean Starkman and Guy Rolnick. For more research, analysis, and commentary, visit us online at chicagobooth.edu slash capideas. And join us again next time for another Big question. Goodbye.